Hi there, Graham Vincent, violin maker and musician. Um, I'm shaping a uh, violin neck today. Um, I thought I'd kind of go through the sequence of events uh, for me um, around sort of shaping violin necks. Um, so I thought it might be useful. Um, I won't do the whole process. I've taken it part way already. Um, I'm kind of cleaning it up at the moment, but I will describe exactly how I got there. Um, power tools. The only one I use for this, I mean, obviously, apart from the blank being cut on the bandsaw, is I do actually use a really, really cheap um, little, I don't know what you call it, it's like a Dremel substitute thing. Um, hobby drill, it's called here. <laughs> I think these are like, well, I think I paid 12 quid for this one, but they're like 18 pounds or something. Um, quite, quite, quite easy to use. I've just got a tiny little, um, I think it's an 80 grit sounding sort of drum in the end of it. And obviously that produces a lot of dust, but it does cut things down really quickly. So because it produces a lot of dust, the other power thing that I use in the workshop a lot, and I use this for hand sanding operations and all sorts, is this is just a bit of cheap um, bathroom extractor fan ducting. So I've got that in the workshop and you can see it going out through an old window there and it's got an inline fan in it that's really cheap and I just leave that on a lot of the time so I can sort of just like bring it close to where I'm working and you can see dust in the air sort of going and disappearing which is great I will turn it off for a minute although I probably would have it on normally for this sort of operation I'm doing at the moment so Okay, um, this kind of all starts really when you when you glue the neck on. Um, sometimes in the past, I've actually sort of glued necks on with the fingerboard on already, um, so that I can set up the projection. Um, I mean, at the position of the bridge, there wants to be a sort of a, normally you go for about 27 millimeters to uh, a line flat on the fingerboard um, or you can I mean the other, what I did in this particular case um, was I, I glued the neck on before I put the fingerboard on and in which case the same way that you do that you put a, a longer ruler obviously on the on the neck itself and that should give you from memory I think it's about 15 millimeter sort of upstand um, at the bridge position so uh, it's actually, I think it's easier with the fingerboard glued on already because it does make it blindingly obvious whether you've got it lined up or not. I mean, you want the fingerboard to, you know, the fingerboard should be projecting through nicely between the, the Fs and so on. So it's, it's a really useful thing to have to actually see what's going on. Um, so the first thing I did um, after that was glued on, Oh, and I, I ought to say, I don't take the fingerboards off again. Um, a lot of people will have them just tacked lightly, lightly in place with a little bit of glue, take them off, finish the violin, put them back on. I don't. I don't do that at all. They go on once, they stay on, and I actually sort of do any staining and varnishing with that in place. And we know that Stradivarius did it like that. So I feel like I'm in reasonable company. So there we go. How do you know Stradivarius did it like that? Because on some of his original untouched violins, like the viola that's in the, that was made for the Spanish royal family, um, which is completely untouched, unlike all his other instruments really, um, there's an area which is stained, but is not varnished underneath the original fingerboard. So we know that he did it that way. Okay, so moving along quickly, um, yeah. Um, God, I'm going off on a tangent. We know that he put the fingerboard on later um, for various reasons, but I mean, he his neck was attached to the rib garland before the front and the back went on. Obviously, I make the actual corpus, the whole body, then I glue the neck onto it. So it's, you know, subtly different. Well, no, completely different. <laughs> okay, I've gone off on such a tangent. Here we go. Shaping the neck, on we go. So, after it's all glued on, after I'm happy with it, um, the first thing I do is 
when it's dry, I then check that projection. And often I might have to adjust that a little bit. And the way that I adjust that is by doing a final shaping on the fingerboard, um, and which I can use to just bring it down half a millimeter or whatever. So once that's done, and I'm happy with the surface of the fingerboard, then I have, um, I mark out a center line and I then mark a position which I think is about where the curve wants to end, there and here. And then I tend to work to using one of these and I'm looking for generally in the region of 18 and a half millimetres there, 20 and a half millimetres there from the fingerboard front in the centre to the back of the neck in the centre. So I get a rasp, a file, and I work up to that line that I put where I want the curve to end. I'll take that down to um, a point 20 and a half there, 18 and a half there, join the dots in between. And then I, and you can still see it here on this one, then I will curve the sides round and will not start the curve. Um, how can I explain it? This section here running through wants to be uncurved, so to speak, just simply the neck. So, um, yeah, if I draw a line there for you and there, so everything between those two pencil lines there and there kind of wants to just be the simple curve. Um, I've not completely finished shaping that yet, so that's not quite the case yet. So, using predominantly a rasp and a file, I'll get that area down. Same on the other side. This one, I've got to the point where I'm, I'm doing this one side. I'm happy with that. And I'm just about to start taking this one beyond rough shaping. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm having got the centre down to that nice straight line between 18 and a half to 20 and a half, I put a pencil line on it and I try and leave that there for the bulk of this exercise so that I, I've got a high spot to work to from both sides. So I round those in. I then knives, smaller generally um, files, and occasionally I use little diamond files as well. I will work in and finish the shaping of the neck so that I've got that. that those measurements, that 18 and a half, that 20 and a half, that particular shape of the area that is effectively just a simple neck shape without the curve starting. If you've got those, then that gives you a nice feel of neck. Some people will go for a profile that's, um, try and do this with my hands for you, that's more like a guitar neck, almost like a like a D, like a semicircle virtually. Um, in fact, yeah, you know what? These scrapers will do this perfectly. Um, so some people's neck profile would be like a semicircle, and then others will have more of more, more like a catenary arch, which would be be more like that effectively. So there's like a tighter radius in the centre and then sort of straightening out each side. So that's the fingerboard down here, back of the neck there, if that makes sense. So that way up, yes. <laughs> um, however, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a fiddle player, so I tend to do it by what feels good. I just keep going until I'm happy with it. And mine tend to end up probably slightly more semi-circular, just a little bit accentuated towards that kind of profile, but not as marked as that. Um, so, I mean, that, that again, I mean, you, you know, different players like different feeling necks and you will find the people who like your instruments naturally. So uh, there we go. That's how I do it. Um, I think that's probably all I need to say about that. So let me get on with it. Anyway, I shall say bye-bye. 
Cheers, folks. Look after yourself. See you soon.